Hi, I'm Kayla Iacovino, and I'm going to be talking to you today about volcanic gas chemistry and how we can use thermodynamic modeling to say something about magmatic volcanic processes at depth and potentially to determine eruption triggers. I also wanted to thank the conveners of this session for inviting me to give this talk. So I wanted to start out by showing some images that uh, illustrate the evolution of volcanic gas monitoring techniques throughout the decades. You can see these pictures from over the last 40 years, uh, culminating in this picture at the bottom right of a drone on the flanks of Turialba volcano in Costa Rica, uh, being outfitted with sensors to measure the chemistry of a volcanic gas plume in near real time in situ. And the point of this slide is to drive home the message that as a scientific community, we've gotten to the point where we're very good at collecting lots of high quality, um, high frequency data from active volcanoes. And now what we need to do to catch up to our ability to collect these data is work on our ability to um, analyze these data after the fact. Now, volcanic gases have been used in volcanic uh, monitoring for a very, very long time. Um, and what I'm showing you here on the right is um, an, a, a plot showing how the composition of a gas will change depending on the pressure at which it was created and released. So here, the left side of the plot is deep within the volcanic system, and on the right, we have um, the surface at one bar. And you can see that a gas that originated from deeper in the system is gonna be more rich in CO2, carbon. Um, a gas that came from very shallow in the system will be more rich in H2O, or the more commonly measured um, SO2 and other sulfur species. And so this relationship has been used for a very long time to say something qualitative about volcanic eruptions. If the gas chemistry at the surface is becoming more CO2 rich, then we can hypothesize that there's new emplacements of magma at depth deep within the system. Conversely, if our SO2 to CO2 ratio is increasing, we can say that we might be seeing some kind of an infiltration of magma into the shallow system where new magma is coming there and then degassing shallowly. Now, this can also say something about changing hydrothermal systems because some of these gases, namely SO2, are soluble in water. And so a decrease in SO2 can also indicate the influence of a hydrothermal system. So the question now becomes, can we take all that we know about volcanic systems and build a quantitative standard model to deal with this influx of data. What I'm gonna be talking to you about today is an example of a very small piece of this broader vision of this generalized tool. I'm not gonna go over this in detail, but just to say that any kind of a model that we might conjure up to meet this goal would have to be all of these things. It would have to be thermodynamically based. It should use existing modeling strategies that already are there in literature. Um, it should facilitate the usability of this tool at all skill levels, including and perhaps more importantly, by those at volcanic observatories. And finally, we want this tool to be responsive in order to take in the data and say something about how it was generated, but also to be potentially a predictive tool for volcanic activity. And the way I'm gonna show you an example of this is by taking you on a field trip to Poas Volcano located in Costa Rica. You can see its location here on the map on the left. This is a subduction zone related volcano um, from the subduction of the Pacific Plate into the Cocos Plate. And here on the right is an image of Poas Volcano looking into the crater on a beautiful sunny day. You'll see this uh, water aqueous um, acid lake here in the center and some fumarelic degassing on the side of the lake. Now Poas is known to relatively frequently have medium to large size phreatic eruptions like the one shown in this image. And in some of these cases, the eruption can be so large as to completely evacuate the lake and to totally change the morphology of what's inside of the crater. And such an eruption occurred in 2017. What you're seeing here on the right is an image that would have been looking down at the lake. This is actually the old shoreline of the lake that was there before the eruption. You can see the water is completely gone now. Um, this red arrow indicates um, an ashy eruption and this yellow arrow is pointing to a bright yellow secondary cone um, made up of sulfur that was actually revealed because of this evacuation of the lake. Uh, here on the left, you can see more pictures. Um, this one here is a picture of that same cone. You see this beautiful canary yellow color and that's almost entirely made of sulfur. And again, this yellow plume. 
In fact, all of the images I'm showing here are images of the collection of sulfur flows and other sulfur deposits made after the eruption. So even just from looking at these pictures, you can already tell that this was a very unique eruption and that it was uh, very large and explosive, and it was extremely sulfur rich. And that's reflected in the data as well. Here on the left, you have um, gas composition. On the right, you have gas flux. Uh, the top here is SO2-CO2 ratio, and the bottom is H2S-SO2 ratio. You'll see this is from a very long period of time back from 2013 um, all the way up to late 2019. And I want to draw your attention to a few regions in this plot. So we have two, what I'm calling passive regions, where we had sort of typical, typical behavior po for POAS, maybe some of these small to medium-sized phreatic eruptions, but typical background levels of what we'd expect to see in the gas. And then we have um, a, the run-up to the eruption, which was that the eruption occurred at this um, red line here, was the start of that explosive eruption. Um, and the run-up to that eruption, uh, we saw this very distinct change in the gas chemistry, both in terms of SO2-CO2 um, decreasing and H2S-SO2 increasing dramatically. At the same time, um, this corresponds to this region, sort of a cutout of the region on the left, and we see some relatively standard SO2 fluxes. Um, and again, note that this is in a log scale. Um, and at the time of the eruption, the SO2 flux increased to over 2,000 tons per day, which is the highest SO2 flux ever measured at POAS Volcano. That corresponds to this extremely high SO2-CO2 ratio here. So again, extremely sulfur-rich eruption. And the question that we want to ask is, how was this gas generated? Did this gas come directly out of a magma? Or was there something else that we need to explain this extremely sulfur-rich behavior, and, and including this run-up, you know, what was occurring inside of the volcano the time leading up to the eruption? So the way we're going to attack this is to use a modeling strategy developed for a very well-constrained system. So this is a, an image of the subsystem of the Erebus volcano located in Antarctica. Uh, we have a ton of data concerning the petrology, the mineralogy, melt inclusions, all these things that give us information about the depth of the volcano, as well as really excellent surface gas data. So in 2015, a model was developed to try and tie those two things together, surface to subsurface, um, by developing a thermodynamic a parameterization that could link all of those data together. And so this was shown to work well for Erebus, where we have these well-constrained endpoints and we could come up with a system to connect the two in between. But POAS is a bit of a different story. Um, at POAS, we again have this very, very excellent and copious amounts of surface gas data, but what we don't have is information about the subsurface. And that's typical for most volcanoes. Um, we don't have melt inclusions. We have some geochemical data on the erupted lavas, but not a whole lot. Um, at POAS, there's an added wrench in that there's a hydrothermal system, which again, can interact with and change the compositions of our gases coming out the top. So, how do we apply this modeling strategy? Well, again, we have this really well-constrained endpoint of the surface gas, and we can come up with, we can imagine a set of parameters that could describe the subsurface. So we know something about POAS volcano, and we know something about volcanoes in general. So we can come up with a range of parameters, a range of pressures, temperatures, oxygen fugacities, and volatile concentrations in the subsurface that might be possibly feasible. Anything outside of this imaginary range is just not possible for a magmatic system as we know it. And so we can take a very, very wide set of parameter values, put that into our model, and see which of those paths gives us um, gas compositions that match those that we measure in the field. And this is just a schematic representation of that. So the question we want to ask is, can we identify magmatic gas signatures? If we can do that, we can say, Anything that's not a magmatic gas signature requires some other explanation. And so on the left here, I'm showing you all possible gas compositions with no constraints whatsoever. It's a finite set of all possible gas compositions. If we add some constraints, here's the constraints that we used here. This is a very wide set of parameters. We can come up with an even more finite set of feasible magmatic gas compositions at POAS. And those are shown here in the green triangles. So we've created these synthetic gas compositions, and we can take our synthetic gas compositions and compare them to our natural measured ones. And where our synthetic gases can reproduce the natural ones, we can say, okay, that 
natural gas composition could have been produced by magma alone. If not, if these two things do not overlap, like it's the case right here, we can say something else is required, something beyond simple magmatic degassing is required to explain that magmatic gas signature, that gas signature, excuse me. So let's go ahead and look at the results of that modeling. What I'm showing you here are the same data I showed you earlier, um, with the black dots being the measured gas ratios. Um, and again, I have that SO2 flux plot here as well. And we can plot our synthetic gases on top of this. So what you're seeing now in the yellow dots with the red outlines are cases where our synthetically created gases were a perfect match to both SO2, CO2, and H2S, SO2 ratios. So they had to match both of those ratios. The green bars are the full range of what we're calling magmatic gases. So again, anything that could be feasibly produced by a magmatic degassing at POAS is shown within the green bar. What you'll immediately notice is that the passive regions of this plot are pretty much well within our magmatic gas region. The run-up to the eruption, we see this immediate and precipitous drop-off in SO2-CO2, an increase in H2S-SO2, where we leave that magmatic region. So this is no longer produced by simple magmatic degassing. And again, once the eruption occurs, we overshoot our magmatic ratio and the force settling back down um, into this magmatic region again. So what do we think that means for what's actually occurring at the volcano? Well, our interpretation of this is that this drop-off in the run-up period and this increase in H2S SO2 is very consistent with the infiltration and the increasing influence of a hydrothermal system at POAS. So as I said, SO2 is soluble in water, and so the more and more interaction from a hydrothermal system you have, the more of that SO2 you're removing from the system, and that's, that's evident in both of these plots. So this run-up is, is having a, is, you're seeing less and less magmatic gas, and you're seeing more and more that's been influenced by the hydrothermal system. Now, just before the eruption, if you'll remember, um, here we had zero SO2 flux, essentially. It was below the detection limit. And this is the point at which the hydrothermal system is interpreted to be completely sealed. So no gas at all is able to escape at this point. So we have a buildup of sulfur that's being removed and re-precipitated as sulfur-bearing minerals in the very shallow subsurface more and more and more until that actually completely seals up and no more gas can be released. Shortly after that seal happens, we see this catastrophic release of sulfur-rich gas. So all that sulfur that's been stored is now being remobilized. And we see that not only in this extreme SO2 flux, but also in this overshooting of the SO2-CO2 ratio to so something well above a magmatic range. <clears throat> So what's cool about this is that you could come up with a hypothesis like this by looking at the data qualitatively. Right? You could look at the images, you could look at the data and say, okay, this looks like the influence of hydrothermal activity. Um, but what we are able to show here is that using thermodynamics, this is also qualitatively what the data are telling us. So we can say for sure, this is more than a hypothesis. Um, this is also backed by the numbers of the data themselves rather than just in a qualitative way. And this is just sort of an image of, of what I was just describing, showing the, the increased movement of those gases, the buildup of the hydrothermal seal or carapace, and then the rupturing of that seal and the release of all of that sulfur that got stored in the shallow crust. So I'm going to end this talk here with a couple of takeaway points. The number one being that I just wanted to re-impress the need for a generalized model that can do this kind of quantitative interpretation of gas data. So this was just a small slice of what might be possible with that. And thermodynamically based models like the one I showed you here are extremely versatile and show promise for allowing us to answer a whole load of questions that we have about volcanic systems. Uh, thank you very much and I look forward to taking your questions in the Q&A session.